An article in a newspaper you don't remember buying. A happenstance you weren't quite aware of. A bulletin posted on a board in the middle of nowhere. You have found the Phenomenals Podcast. Hello, you rogue and volatile mix of star components. You have tuned into the Phenomenarts Podcast, a weekly show where we look at the weird, wonderful, and mysterious happenstances of our and occasionally other universes. Taking you on this wild ride is myself, D Barnes, and the ever awesome Amber Hall. Nice. We are a multi platform podcast, so find us on YouTube, the new channel, the Phenomenarts Podcast. Uh, we're still going to be uploading Sealed One for a little bit, but. Do you make sure to get switched over because that won't be for much longer. you got to get that brand uh, identity. Yep. We're professional. Unify it all. Uh, we're still, yeah, we'll still be uploading to there for a little bit. Um, but, like I said, that will end fairly soonish. Mm. Uh, we're also on iTunes, Spotify, Transistor. So please do remember to like, follow, share, subscribe, download, and all that lovely stuff. I got stuck a little bit there. Did you yeah, notice that? Yeah, you did. You were like, oh my god, we've made it. We've made it, Amber. <laughs> we're on iTunes. <laughs> yeah, take your pick. So, Amber, how's it going? Uh, I, I'm a bit hungry, to be honest. Hungry? Yeah. I, I, I had garlic mash with Ooh, dinner earlier. That sounds nice. So that that was interesting. And basically, at work, while they were doing training, I was just sat at my computer just smashing out the notes. Nice. Because I hadn't, nice. I hadn't done them, because I mean, I'm a waste person. Oh, don't say that. You know you're not. Human garbage. No, you are not. Stop this. I'm like some kind of tumbleweed made out of crap. You're awesome. Stop it. Thanks. <laughs> How are you? I'm 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 doing okay, you know. Just just getting on. Just getting on. Just getting on. Mosey on down. Well, keeps turning. Wheels keep on, but burning. Wait, what? <laughs> we- <laughs> what? <laughs> Wheels keep on turning. Ah, it's proud Mary. Proud Mary keeps on, on burning. burning. Should we crack on? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a copyright hit right there. We'll stop uh, that no, right you off. have to do it for like thirty seconds before it's actually a copyright hit. Then let's get um, okay, <laughs> let's, cool. let's get to it. Okay, so we got another, we got a grab bag for you fine folks this week, yeah. uh, and I'll kick us off because some short little stories, but I think we can we can make some fun out of them. Mm-hmm. So first one this week was was kind of an interesting little tidbit I found on a cryptid we haven't quite discussed yet. A cryptid um, tidbit. The cryptid bit. The cryptid bit. Yeah. Can that be the episode title? Crypt, cryptid bit. Cryptid bit. I like it. Um, okay, I need to find a place again. Why am I like this? <laughs> You've messed it up. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, the Loch Ness Monster. I don't know if we've mentioned it at any point, but, you know. I, I don't think we have, but that is such a... That is the main cryptid. It's the main it's boss a, one. It's a big cryptid. It's a big it's old like, cryptid. It's like the Mario of cryptids. Yeah. OG cryptid. OG. Original cryptid. Right, but yeah, um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on Old Nessie because I'll save that for another episode. And I, I think it's pretty well known. Most people have a concept of the idea of the Loch Ness monster, right? Yeah, I mean, I, if we did talk about it more in depth in the future, I would like to get into the biology. Of yeah, things, of course, because there's I, I like looking at it from a science point. Yeah, of without view, a so. doubt. Um, so it's often described as large in size, with a long neck, one or more humps protruding from the water. This uh, recent story I was reading provides another explanation for the sightings of this elusive and popular cryptid. I have lost my place again. There we go. Uh, Professor Neil Gemmel of the University of Otago, uh, alongside his research team, examined 250 samples of water from Loch Ness. Uh, and it's... We were to say something. I just... I don't know, I guess I would just assume that any sample of the water would be the same as, as another one. Well, they did two, They took 250 samples. Then again, water can remember homeopathy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that is not going to sound good on the mic. <laughs> no, it's not. Rip headphone users. <laughs> Come on, let's find out. I want to know. I'm right. done interrupting you because I'm a little waste garbage. No, tumbleweed. you are not. You are amazing. Go. Stop. Um... Yeah, team examined 250 samples of water from Loch Ness, and it's worth noting, this wasn't the whole purpose of the study. Um, it was to improve knowledge of what plants and animals live in Loch Ness. It wasn't just, oh, we're going to go and, you know, right. look for Loch Ness. Right, okay. Um, and among the DNA, they found human, a dog, sheep, cattle, deer, 
badgers, rabbits, voles, birds, etc. But no DNA that would match with prehistoric reptilian life. I don't know, a giant badger. <laughs> well. Pretty devastating. Dun dun dun. Dun dun dun. Dun dun dun. That said, they did find eel DNA. <gasps> Ooh. In one of the articles I read, Gamel mentions that an extraordinarily long-lived eel could grow as long as 13 feet. Damn. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that's, that's you know... I like where you're coming from. But, it, it, you know, it could be... Uh, just a monster eel. Just a eel. big eel. A big old eel. Big eel. Big eel. Big eel. Giant eel. Giant eel. Enormous eel. Loch Ness eel. <laughs> that, yeah, I but mean, yeah, that, that, was... that would... Like, have you seen eels? They're, terif- yeah. they're terrifying. Horrific abominations. It's like the forces of nature have just given up on them. <laughs> and, they just, and they just stopped evolving. <laughs> they, ju- they look like an evil handbag. Aww. So, like, yeah, if there's one... Th- 13 feet. Like, what? A so big eel. Think of a tall friend. I don't know, you're, you're like six foot, aren't you? I'm six two, yeah. Yeah, so it's like twice the length of you. That's like two me's. That's like... So it's going to be like thick. Hang on, if it's twelve. That's six foot long subway's big. No, it's not. It would look mm. like it as well. Twelve of them. An evil subway. Why can't I do maths? <laughs> <sighs> that, is, yeah. that is wild. Well, that was my uh, cryptid bit to start us off. Cryptid bit. I love it. Uh, I was wondering if you wanted, do you yeah, want to do an eel. Second? You know what? Because that that was a very brief like skim over that, but I reckon if we rooted into that as well, I would like to look at what what's the feasibility. You know the whole um, Jurassic Park thing. Yeah, oh, we found DNA, for, you know, trapped in amber. Yeah, and the the thing is that DNA doesn't just last forever. I should hope you have DNA. Well, I should hope so too. But then again, I am a machine. <laughs> When it comes to the sesh, oh <laughs> no! I'd love to. I'd love to dive into that a little bit more. Cause, yeah, because if someone went, it's a, a dinosaur that's still knocking around. And go right. What are the conditions that you need well, for a dinosaur well, to live? Well, Could it live in a body of water that yeah. size? And then also, I do just want to look at. Well, why this, you can't get Jurassic this Park. This was why I didn't go too far into it, because I figured we could actually pick it up and do a full expose on Nessie at some point. I, I like Just, that. Uh, this was a little little crypt tidbit. I, can't, I keep, can't stop saying it now. <laughs> we'll put a pin in it. Put a pin in it. Listen for that one in the future, folks. It's an excuse to keep listening and watching. Oh, yes. Shameless you self-plug. Didn't, if you didn't already need an excuse. <laughs> um, so, mine's a bit of a weird one, because um, I'm kind of talking about language, but you'll see how it smoothly segues into my kind of segment. Yeah. And you know the kind of things that I'm interested okay. in and going about. Uh, so, language. It, symbols that carry meaning. Okay. Quite, you know, just a very basic kind of idea of that if you want to reduce it down. Yeah. So, language is one, one way of communicating, sure, but as you may have guessed, there's other ways of communicating too. So, body language, uh, even in the inflection of, uh, of something spoken, sometimes you just get a bad vibe from someone. You know, the, it doesn't yeah. have to be verbal or written. Sometimes it can be someone's got threatening posture yep. or... I don't know, they just move into order in a certain way. Yeah. That kind of thing. Um, so even beyond that, like, uh, and this is a very, very abstract way, which is probably going to make me sound crazy, but hold on. Okay. So even beyond that, let's say it's cold. I feel it. The cold carries meaning. Cold, bad. In that case, you could f- feel when it's time to leave the park if you're having a picnic. Yeah, words associated with thoughts and feelings. With, with no words you are gaining information from your surroundings through your senses yeah. of, of all kinds. Um, so it gets colder, it gets darker, and meaning is drawn from your environment. Information is communicated to you from your environment without any language at all. Mm-hmm. But you understand it because you've attributed meaning to the, the yeah. experience, the feeling. Uh, so communication of information doesn't have to be via language. There's alternate ways to communicate information. So this is the gist I got from uh, a concept called semiosis. So I think you remember this is yeah, this is the book I was reading. Yes, you, yeah. So that has been such an interesting book that I went. I've got to learn more about this. It's fantastic. So it, it is just like a field of science, basically. Um, so yeah, the, the, this is kind of the gist that I got from it. So um, uh, yeah. So I was just uh, explaining about the book in my notes, but uh, I just want to make sure that everyone knows by Sue Burke semiosis. Go and check it out. It's a good book. Um, In the book, humans land on an exoplanet. Eager to begin the first non-Earth colony, they soon find that the local life forms exhibit forms of intelligence they weren't expecting. 
So I'm still reading through it, but it's been very entertaining so far, and I would recommend it to anyone who's into sci-fi at all. Mm. Um, anyway, the concept of semiosis refers to any activity or process, like any activity or process, that involves signs and the production of meaning from those signs. Now, I don't mean signs as in like billboards for radio stations or, you know, Minecraft posters or your year four drawings of Tutankhamun. <laughs> By signs, I mean like anything really, like a written word, a spoken word, a secret signal, a pen shape thrown down on the dance floor, <laughs> an emoji, a pheromone, a chemical, a tremor, an idea, anything that can carry meaning, the sun going down, anything. Mm. Um, so I don't know, maybe I'm stretching it a little bit there, but... Yeah, no, 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 I'll stick with you. Stay with me, stay with me. Um, so let, let's backtrack a little bit. So all of, um, all the way back to 1999. Amber was but a wee babe, whimsically enjoying a fru at lunchtime. No, no, but for real though, like back to the bloody 1800s, I think. So two guys, two bros, two absolute living dudes. <laughs> well, well, not anymore, obviously. Uh, for for obvious reasons. Well, well, yeah. For obvious it's, reasons. It's I while. mean, come on, it's the 1800s. Yeah. They're dead now. Um, only Keanu Reeves and Paul Rudd are still alive from then, anyway. So, um, so there's a man called Cha- <laughs> there's a man called Charles Sanders. Charles Sanders Pierce. Uh, we'll call him Logic Man. Okay. And there's a man called Ferdinand de Saussure. We'll call him Language Man. Ah, okay. So Pierce lusted only for the forbidden knowledge of logic, and Saussure craved the ineffable mysteries of linguistics. Um, so I'll stop having it up now, I'm sorry. I mean, I think it's good. It's yeah. good content. Uh, Pierce was into logic uh, as a study, and Saussure was into language as a study. Both realised that there was more to significant representation of things than language. Mm-hmm. So in the narrow sense of language as speech and writing and all that. Okay. So they combined forces to develop the idea of semiosis, to study the relation between language and other sign systems. So that's both human and non-human okay. sign systems. All right. Now, I'll level with you. I read about this for all of a few days, and I don't claim to be an expert. Uh, besides, there aren't many citations on Wikipedia. I, okay. th- I think it's a very tight-knit like, community of people who, who study it. Okay. Uh, so let me save my own reputation and uh, dish this next bit out verbatim. So get ready for this week's Amber Simply Reads Out a Wikipedia article. Here goes. <laughs> Today, there is disagreement as to the operating cause and effect One school of thought argues that language is the semiotic prototype and its study illuminates principles that can be applied to other sign systems. The opposing school argues that there is a meta-sign system and that language is simply one of many codes for communicating that meaning, citing the way in which human infants learn about their environment before they have acquired verbal language. Whichever may be right, a preliminary definition of semiosis is any action or influence for communicating meaning by establishing relationships between signs which are to be interpreted by an audience. Mm-hmm. So it's any relation between okay. a sign and an understanding by some by an okay. observer. Yeah, that makes sense. So I thought that was a good example. Yeah, that's actually a really ba- good. Babies understand about the world around them before yeah. they even learn language. So there must be a way for you to understand yeah. things and gain meaning and attribute meaning in your brain without mm-hmm. being able to put words to it. Yeah. Um, so on a level, I don't, I don't really get that. <laughs> like I get it vaguely, but I don't really get. I mean, some it makes of the sense. Um, so get ready for this week's Amber reckons something. <laughs> Here goes. <laughs> I like this. I like this as a segment. This is good. Even before you can comprehend language, you can learn about the world around you. Mm-hmm. Feel something soft and warm. Mm, good feelings. Pathway in brain created. Meaning attributed. Yeah. Uh, blanky equals cosy. Yep. Yeah. Okay, yeah, this all makes uh, sense. Etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Now the two schools of thought, I reckon, are one, we attribute meaning to things with language. We can literally generate meaning in things where there is none, or two, the meanings are already there, we just describe them. There is a deeper meaning with or without us here to ponder it. Like there's an abstract like meaning to things. We discover the meaning as opposed to create it. So that, that's what I think the two schools of thought are. But can I butt in a little bit? Go, go. Because I'm wondering if this will, this is a really this is a good example. It might not be. Mm-hmm. So is it like how we've had that discussion about how we all kind of just agree on things? Yeah. So like how we all agree, kind of just agree that you know, the the blue in this this tablecloth is a, this is a shade of blue. Yes. Yeah. So, but it's weird though because you you've attributed meaning to the color you're seeing, but that doesn't mean it's the same color. But you've attributed the same meaning mm, okay. to something yeah. that you experience. So, 
possibly the fact that we have language yeah. and it's so well developed and so like structured means that we all come to a consensus. Okay. That doesn't necessarily mean that our experience is the same. Yeah. I could think it was cold in this room, you could think it was hot. Yeah. But we both kind of know what you know, we're both feeling the temperature yeah. and we've got an idea of what is good and what's bad. Yeah. Um so the the whole like, you know, two schools of thought, do you attribute meaning, do you create meaning? It reminds me of the maths problem. And in a way it is the same problem. Did we invent maths or did we discover maths? What do you think? Ah, oh, I, I do like these. Do we create the maths or do we simply, have we found it and we describe it? It's interesting because say it was something else, like say time or gravity where it's like... Time though. Oh, yeah, even still. Oh, this is this is weird. I like this a lot. But I, I, just, I like it. It's very abstract and I, it had me yeah. pondering. No, hmm. it, do, it does make you think quite a lot, I think. Yeah. Um, so it, it, if we make the meaning, that's, that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. So by exploring ideas through language and expression in all of its forms, we are broadening and deepening the universe mm. simply by yeah. gaining more information Definitely. about it. So we're creating more detail, more more just more everything more more and i just think that's fantastic Hmm. so to be having that impact on reality to be having a conversation such as this one that we're having right now yeah to experience more music media events we are the universe and we as part of the universe are creating a richer universe that is a deeply moving concept yeah i quite i like that That, a lot it fills me with wonder Mm. like existence is beautiful because we can understand and experience as Mm. the universe itself I think that's fantastic. Yeah. So that's that's really cool if it's that. Um, oh, also, um, have you? You may have heard of this concept. Um, uh, the concept that there is a world made entirely of ideas, and all real things are imitations of those ideas. Yes. It's like a ph- philosophical yes. concept. So it's a worldview attributed to Plato. Yeah. Like there's an idea of a chair, and all existing chairs are simply renditions of the idea of a chair. Um, so this is similar to semiosis, as the objects referred to by a symbol are, like, the symbol is first, and then the actual objects are second. Yeah. So there's a meaning, and then we create something to yeah. describe it in the same way that we would create a word to describe something that simply already exists. Mm-hmm. We discover maths. We discovered chairs. Chairs, yeah. it, chairs existed as an idea, whether or not any, anyone had built any. Yeah. Very, very strange. Uh, but I digress. Uh, there's at least one other thing that I want to uh, I want to cover today. So let me set the scene by simply reading Wikipedia. <laughs> Here <Well>. goes. <laughs> As an insect or animal, human or otherwise, moves through its environment, all the senses collect data that are made available to the brain. However, to prevent sensory overload, only important and relevant data will receive the full attention of the mind. This indicates that a part of the process must be controlled by a model of the real world capable of ranking data elements in terms of their significance and filtering out data irrelevant to survival. A sign cannot function until the brain or audience distinguishes it from the background noise. So... Part of the process must be controlled by a model of the real world. By that I mean your internal subjective reality, the one that you experience. So the simulation of the world that exists inside your imagination and is given meaning by semiosis. If if you've had like the raw data from every sense at all times, you would be overwhelmed, but instead you only focus on the important stuff. So what's important? Somehow you've attributed meaning to things and somehow you've ranked those things in terms of importance to yourself. You have attributed meaning to symbols yeah. So that's yeah. Se- that semiosis. So the fact that you have a, a model of things in your brain and then you go, I need to pay attention to that. That though, that bit of wall over there, zone it out. No point. Yeah, pretty it's much. Not important. But when like something's flying towards me, I pay more attention to that. Yeah. But that must mean that I understand and I can rank by importance. This is crazy. So you simulate, you simulate the world in your own head. This is referred to as the Umwelt by the way, and I'm Ooh. so glad that I finally found the word for it as I stumbled across it. Umwelt. I like that word. Cool. Um, using this simulation, you can predict what will happen. The object drops, you extend your hand below it to catch it. How could you have known? There is meaning to the signs. All information is calculated in the Umwelt. Ooh. <laughs> Scout bees and ants will return home and tell the others where the food is. The presence of danger must be passed as a warning to others in the group. Such transmission may be chemical, auditory, visual, or tactile. Take the slime mold, for example. 
episode 34. Our friend the slime go, mold. Go watch it, episode 34. Pew. Um, so if a single slime mold cell encounters another, they communicate via quorum sensing. They release chemicals that signal to the other cell that they are the same. And instead of fighting, they dissolve their cell walls and fuse because they understand that to be a, it's a beneficial move mm. for them. So when the superorganism made of thousands of slime mold cells leaves an area devoid of food, it leaves slime. If it comes back and encounters the slime it left, the meaning is clear. Nothing to see here. Move along. Mm -hmm. Slime molds anticipate changes in their environment. Does this mean they have an internal model of the universe? An umwelt? I guess. Right? Yeah. They must. Yeah, I guess. So I'll, I'll also refer you to episode 35. Go and watch it as well. Uh, I'll compare the idea of intelligence and consciousness. Life forms signal. They create meaning and respond accordingly. What's to say the slime mold doesn't have some kind of experience? There must be a way that it is like to be a slime mold. To hit into slime and all of a sudden stop wanting to go that way. To have experienced adverse conditions every 30 minutes and then, unprovoked, retreat from nothing. By having a concept of the world, the slime mold can anticipate undesirable conditions. So there must be a way that it experiences. Yeah, it, it must they're, have, yeah. They're actually thinking of changing the definition of life, you know, like excretion, uh, motility, yeah. all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And they want to include semiosis in it because ah. it seems like life forms do it, but inorganic stuff don't because they can't attribute meaning. Yeah, but even bacteria I, can go, ah, dry, like, you know, retreat, like they respond to they, things yeah. because they've ranked them by what's important to them in survival. Mm, no, that makes a lot of sense. So That's very cool. So this is the last bit. I'll, I'll stop talking now, but I'll wrap it up with this. Um, biosemiotics seeks to redefine the scientific view of life to include sign processing, including meaning and interpretation as an intrinsic feature of life. If something signs, it must be alive. All very important things to ponder, especially with technology on the verge of allowing the direct observation of exoplanets. James Webb Space Telescope, holler at me. We are st we're on the cusp of being able to detect life out in the universe. So it's very important for us to actually get yeah. a definition of, of yeah, life. Yeah, I think you've got to really narrow that down before we start looking for it. But yeah, that is just based off the book that I was reading. Really fantastic book. I had a lot of fun reading about that. It's a bit abstract, to be honest. I, I hope mean, I hope everyone no, followed. No, it, it made a lot of sense and it made for a really good listen. Like, I, it, yeah, it was really eye-opening. I enjoyed that a lot. Nice work. Please tell me that your next thing is a little bit lighter. Uh, I'm actually going to read... You segued me perfectly here. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, it's actually going to be a bit of a throwback. Do you remember me talking about uh, Rupkund or Skeleton Lake? Oh, yes. Skeleton... Oh. Yeah. There's, is, is there more news? Yes, just a little. Not much, but enough that it's just a bit of a... Oh, that's interesting. The plot and thickness. It very much does. <laughs> So in short, if you don't remember, feel free to go back and listen it to our older episodes. We've really done this, this, the self-plug in this week, haven't we? No. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, it's a lake in the Himalayas. It has visible human skeletons at the edge, more at the bottom whenever the snow melts. Um, there were a few possible explanations for this, but now the mystery has deepened. After, <laughs> after a full genomic analysis of 38 skeletons showed that 23 had South Asian ancestry, but they died during several events between the 7th and 10th century, with another group of 14 victims who died thousands of years later. The second group of remains had genetic ancestry tied to Greece and Crete, and an additional individual who died at the same time as the second group who had East Asian ancestry. Now, oh. it was previously speculated that victim... That the victims were on a pilgrimage when caught in a deadly hailstorm, which actually went with a local legend as well. Yeah. And um, there was a lot of... I would say there was a lot of credit to that, you know, that that it was that one singular singular yeah. event. Yeah, because they said people were, like, smashed on the back of the head and stuff. Yeah. Um, but... And now, but like I said, it was thought that it was a pilgrimage, the people were caught in a deadly hailstorm in one, cat one big catastrophic event. Yeah. But this new evidence refutes a lot of that. Like, yeah, a hell yeah. of a lot of that. It's gone right. Yeah, like, they died in multiple events. Yeah. Oh. Over, like, a big swath of time as well. It's not oh, wait, like a couple of years. They all had smashed in heads at the back. Probably not all of them. Yeah, but, like, who's just taking that to the I imagine it's the, something to do with the climate there, perhaps. Or if it's they... like a of mice and men thing. Just, like, just look at, just think oh of the rabbits. Oh, God. Didn't have to bring of mice and men into this. 
Yes, I did. But but yeah, that was that was an update on Skeleton Lake. Oh, what do you think? What's really nice is if so that will have come out recently. Yes, uh, fairly recently. I'm not sure. You know, might so, be a month or two old. Can't someone's remember. looking into it, which means there will be more news. Exactly. And I love that. Exactly. And I like that. You know, I can pick it back up in a couple months' time, maybe, and be like, Oh, I remember Skeleton Lake. Here's the third time I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> I, re- I like that. Yeah, because I, I thought, wow, they all just got killed in a hailstorm. That's crazy. But you, you've, you like, literally, the plot and thickenizes. The plot and thickenizes. Because now they're all, like, they all died at separate times. Why? Well, not all of them. There were some distinct groups, but yeah. What the hell happened there? Who knows? Oh, I look I look forward to more. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice little mystery I thought I'd, uh, mm. I'd tail us off on. That is, oh, it's a good mystery. I like it. Yeah, and, well... Well, yeah, there you got it, folks. There's a massive medley of content from us this week. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, we really just... Yeah, we really just went for it. Cryptids, uh, like science, and then mystery. Yeah. Take your pick. Grab yeah. bag. we grab bag. Woo. Don't forget about our initiative to introduce the podcast to anyone you think might enjoy it. Let us know your names um, and or their names in the YouTube comments or email us at thephenomenotspodcast at gmail.com. We will give you a shout out live on air. Oh, yes. Catch you all next week, folks. Peace out. Fake niche. (laughs) Don't you have the mouse? (laughs) I do, yeah. (laughs) Don't worry. I've got it. You know what? My throat is really dry. I was just... I was was going ham on that thing. I I just kept looking at the clock and I was like, come on, man. (laughs) I'm just talking about some crazy abstract stuff. There's probably people listening at home just like, oh, Amber, shut up. No. It made a lot of sense. It was really good. I want to see the Skellingtons. (laughs) (laughs) I want to see the Skellingtons. No, that's good. That's that's great, though. The Skellington Lake. Yeah. Lovely. Well, it just cropped up a while ago. I think it might have been on my newsfeed or something. I was like, wait, what? This thing? I'm a big fan of that pun as well. It deepened. (laughs) Lake. It was not meant to be a pun. Oh, you could have you could have done the same pun for for Nessie. I'm disappointed. Mm.